we're going to present something about Equidata Cube and especially how you can access data, but then Leandro yesterday uh, made an excellent presentation that basically covered everything, uh, but then better than we could have done. So we gave it a, like a slight little spin and we will be telling a slight more lighthearted story, but we'll still actually touch on some topics that were, you know, cut popping up in this discussion we just had. So, you know, be patient, bear with us and we'll make it worth your time. So um, this is Luca. Hi. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we've already been traveling a little bit together before this conference and we had, we prepared this presentation together and we'll also be giving it together. First I will do some talking and then he'll do some coding because that's usually how we work. Um, so let's get started. Um, first a little background, like who are we, what did we do and why? So first, uh, this is Luca and I'm Martijn. Um, our employers were roommates. And um, we both started working for these men three years ago uh, to work on a project together. And um, this project basically resulted in something that we call the Echo Data Cube. Uh, this is a data cube that covers uh, several years. It covers most of Europe and it has a lot of different data sets inside of it, so, such as uh, land use, land cover, soil properties, uh, uh, sentinel uh, on, on bands of various uh, uh, bands and uh, resolutions, Landsat. Uh, this NDVI that you see is, for instance, from uh, Landsat. Um, and we will tell you a little bit about its story. So this project that it originates from it was called GeoHarmonizer. It was basically the first real big project that, op that OpenGeoHub uh, uh, was working on, if I understand correctly at least. And uh, this is also where we started collaborating. And during this process of working on GeoHarmonizer with our partners, we uh, started growing and learning a lot of things as we went along. Um, the most important task that I was involved in was uh, land use, land cover mapping, because we basically, as part of this project, promised that we would try to improve Korean land cover maps on, uh, like, um, to make rasters of this, and then you know uh, make them annual, because of course it's a quite expensive process to make these maps. And we thought, well, maybe we can try to just map all these classes. It turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that, because it's an old legend and it was not really designed with remote sensing in mind. Reviewer number two had a couple of things to say about that. But um, one of the most important results was also a platform where you can view all these different data sets. We will actually also like give a short demonstration later. Um, and we will now tell you a little bit about like what we actually did and how. So the most important things that were part of this Korean land cover autom uh, automation project was uh, first harmonizing various kinds of satellite data. Uh, figuring out a machine learn learning pipeline to, you know, do a, a pretty ambitious legend classification problem because it, some of the classes were quite difficult and of course it was also a large number of classes. And then, you know, making this platform. One of the most important components here was the uh, GLAD Landsat, Landsat uh, Analysis Ready Data product that has already been mentioned a couple of times, uh, no wonder, because it's quite great. Um, and because it's been covered so much, I'm just going to skip over it a little bit, but it's great. So we um, basically combined this Landsat data with Sentinel data as separate covariates and uh, also included digital terrain models from various sources, which we combined by Ensemble Machine Learning. Actually, that was mostly Tom, who is also sitting in this room. And we wrote a paper on it. And then we also wrote a paper on land cover classification. I mean, that should be the correct order, but we actually did it the other way around. But uh, so this was the first paper, and then we did the data cube. Um, basically, we um, used ensemble machine learning because we assumed that uh, when you do a classification task and you have different probabilities output by uh, several classifiers, that the disagreement between them is a sort of uncertainty. Well, um, it has no statistical guarantee. We figured that out pretty quickly also during the review process, thanks to reviewer number two as well, I think. He was harsh, but you know, had some good points. Um, but more importantly, the results were actually quite interesting. So, um, or at least fun to you know, talk about. We um, basically wrote a paper where we 
combined all these different data sets and different classification tasks and then checked their accuracy. And actually it turned out that uh, if you combine all these different sources, the uh, accuracy is the highest. So we really figured out that um, the more data you combine, the, the richer the feature space is and the better you can generalize. And um, one of the most important results was these annual land cover maps. Now, um, there was a lot of things wrong with, this land cover, with these land cover maps, especially uh, if you really go to the lowest level of this hierarchical legend. A lot of these classes, as I mentioned before, were not really super accurate. Uh, but we did want to include them because we were supposed to reproduce the Korean land cover legend. Um, However, this platform is more than just land cover classification. For instance, uh, my coworker, uh, Carmelo Bonanella, made uh, really good work on classifying several tree species across Europe where they actually do grow and where they could grow according to climatic variables. And uh, it's really worth checking out. This data is also just simply on EchoDataCube because it's more than just like, you know, one project. We just want to host as many uh, open data sets there as possible. Uh, we also have uh, multi-year uh, and depth soil maps, which is also mostly uh, Tom's work. And um, actually, we're just going to go and show you how to uh, access and play with these things. Because the whole point about this Equidata Cube is not only like, okay, we have the best data or whatever, it's supposed to be supremely easy to access. So I would like to give the floor to Luca now. Right. So can I access the viewer in this URL? So this is, this is, for instance, the land cover. You can, you can view multiple years. You can... Maybe let's go to Bolzano. Bolzano. Great. So what is an interesting land cover class for Bolzano? Anyone? Suggestions? Vineyards? Okay. Let's see. Orchards? We also have those. Quite a few. Yeah. So, like, basically, what I, if I see correctly to the, to the east of town, are those actually vineyards? They should be. They should be? Okay. Hmm. Okay, cool. Well, we validated the map. <laughs> uh, another interesting example that we can actually show is, um, like, actually, an advantage of this, these somewhat unfeasible Korean land cover classes is if we go to Dublin, for instance, and we do a comparison between continuous and discontinuous uh, land cover. And we classify this on a pixel by pixel basis, okay? So, can you really distinguish the two? You actually can, and that's pretty weird. All right. So let's just uh, close this nifty thing. Oh, is it going to Dublin? No. All right. So here we have Dublin. And Dublin is a town known for its really dense urban center. And with a clear distinction between like the, the center, the core, and like then some, some more sprawling suburbs on the outside, at least so I've been told. Let's just check if that's actually true. So we have discontinuous urban fabric here. And let's just have a look at continuous urban fabric. And then continuous urban fabric is supposed to like be like a dense construction. So you would say that you know the historical center should look like this. You see like a nice red blotch in the middle, and then you actually visualize these suburbs who are now red with discontinuous urban fabric. Now, and I think these kinds of things, the probabilities really indicate clear patterns, but it's hard to really, you know, get the pixels right because there's so much confusion between these classes. But like the general picture actually shows it. And uh, this is also something that we're actually thinking about, like how can you improve these kinds of results if you have an ambitious legend? Because a lot of people make, you know, global maps with like eight classes and then, you know, of course the accuracy is high, but like how do you really deal with this problem? And I think uh, someone here, I think it was Peter Strobel, was speaking about 
using the hierarchy of maps. And that's actually something we'll be touching on as a potential solution to this. But then without, you know, by actually improving accuracy and also having like a baseline statistical certainty. Okay. I think that was enough of the viewer. I turn up the book view. Uh, you press C again. All right, that's, fine. that's also possible. So of course, instead of just looking at these layers through the viewer, you can then you can actually use them. You go to this URL here and open, for instance, QGIS. Open it as a raster layer. Is your QJS on dark mode? Yes. Of course. Correct. Okay, we don't actually see much here. Change the legend. I think the range of the probabilities, well, these are, these are classes, these are classes right? These are classes, yeah. Okay, so it's just going to be like 0 to, you know, yeah. uh, 43 instead of 1 to 255, and that's so of course why it's all red. Linear probability instead. Yeah, that's probably better. Invalid data source. Hmm. Well, this is why you should never give a live demo. <laughs> um, you know, like, well, looks all right. Okay. Okay. Well, it's supposed to work. Trust us. Um, how about we just go to the uh, actual programmatic access because it's nice to like you know play around in QJS with URLs, but um, actually like the real way that you can leverage this in a more efficient way is by loading stuff into, for instance, a Jupyter Notebook, which we have prepared. You can access this notebook um, through this QR code. If you want to run it as well, please copy it. Uh, it's it's you, all, you only, but you can copy it to your drive and then run it if you want to. So let's do that now. Okay, just delete all the outputs. Okay, so there was uh, a lot of uh, discussion these past couple of days about various very good um, software packages for dealing with, with geospatial spatial data in a more ergonomic way, like like Xcube and then Scikit-Map and and OpenEO. Um, we're not going to use any of that now. We're just going to use fair, fairly standard Python libraries for for dealing with spatial data. So because Colab uh, doesn't have Raster.io installed by default. Uh, if we can first do that. And we can actually also interact with a, with a stack catalog, which you can browse on your own here. Yeah, this is this how do it do do it from Python. Just instantiate a catalog object from from a catalog file. This is a static catalog. It's just a, it's just a bunch of JSON files. It's not a, not a stack API. So if you run this, we now have a catalog. So if we want to see what's inside of this this thing. So the first is all, of course, the self-reference. 
O ja się. All right. And if we go one more down, we have we have our first first uh, collection in the data cube. So let's do something with that first. So this this collection is is a is a land cover data set that was used to as the as the land mask throughout the geoharmonizer project. So all layers are or should be at least aligned to that. To, to the non-water classes of, of that uh, land cover data set. So let's load that by the ID that we saw earlier and get, get some assets from the first item in the collection. So, so stack is, because stack is hierarchical, you have collections, then items, then assets, and uh, the, actual, the actual TIFFs are, are assets. Right, so these are the assets of the first item. Uh, we have a thumbnail. Thumbnail, we don't really need that. We need this asset here. So if we just access it through through its ID in the asset object, uh, we get the URL. So, it, because this is call up in theory, we maybe could try to load the entire raster um, in the notebook, but if we're doing it locally, we probably can't. Uh, so, we'll define some bounds, which may or may not correspond to Bolzano. I mean, it says here it does, but you never know. These are in, these are in the same projection as the, as the data cube. Uh, I assume all of you here can make polygons in QGIS and, and get government areas of interest, so we won't go needlessly through that part. All right, so now we have a bunch of, we have some bounds and we, we have our URL from the raster and we can actually read some data now. So yeah, we will save the transform for later and take a look at the raster profile. We'll read the data. And this very readable piece of Python code here is just a way to print the results of the profile. All right, so this is the raster profile. Like you can, as you can see, the raster is pretty, pretty large. Um, and we only read this. So moving on, uh, we can plot this to see what we actually have. All right. So, so what are we looking at here? What is the, the bar chart? It's a histogram of classes. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked. Classes nine and 10 are water, actually uh, swamp lands and, and water. The other one are land. So Boltano is practically entirely on the land. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, now, now that we've deduced that, let's, let's see what else we have uh, in our collection that we pulled the raster from. Okay, so it's, the purpose of Stack is not just to provide you links to, to items, it's also to provide metadata. So we have, we have some of that here. We'll be using uh, the, the ID and the titles a bit here because uh, since we're doing with a static stack catalog, we can't use the, the search API and stuff like that that uh, the stack APIs have. Uh, all right, so let's load another land cover catalog, land land cover products that may have been discussed in the past 15 minutes by just uh, searching for collections that have land cover in their ID. This takes a while. So please note that uh, the presentation will be available and it also links to this CoLab notebook, which you can very easily copy and you can even run it on your phone. I tried just uh, before the presentation.
How long does it take? Um, more than 36 seconds, apparently. Hmm. Okay. There's a nice little second count there. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. See, I mean, I mean, I'd really like Jupyter Notebooks, and yeah. you are more of an Emacs enjoyer, but uh, they do have their advantages. Does Emacs also have a like a, a counter or not? A second counter. It has two. No, 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 no. It can have second counters if you code them yourself. Okay, I don't want to distract you from uh, you know. Sorry. All right. So here we have a bunch of collection titles and and uh, IDs. These all these are all from the same data set. So we have the hard class. This is it here, right? And uh, each of the the probabilities of each of the land cover classes. Uh, we'll we'll get a randomly selected one, and look at the items inside the class. Right, so unlike the previous data uh, land cover data set that we looked at, this one is is uh, not this one is a time series. So we can try loading all of those. Actually, let's just look at the assets of the first item first to see how we load the uh, the actual tips. Right, so because uh, like I said, stack is hierarchical. Uh, multiple um, assets because we can, can have the same ID. So we can just load this one from each of the items. And should we do that and get a bunch of URLs? So that means that we are now basically extracting a time series. Exactly. Okay. Well, not yet, we're just extracting URLs of the time series. Gotcha. In a moment. Patience. Okay. How, how much patience? 16, 17 seconds. All right. Okay. Someone, I guess. It was faster than last time, I swear. Well, I think that's also, isn't that like a, a vulnerability or like a weakness of uh, using Google Colab because they kind of like throttle processing power sometimes to like make sure that everyone has some? Yeah, I think this this in particular is a weakness of, of the Wasabi service. Because mm. it's, a, it's a lot of JSON files and they do some throttling as well. Mm. Does that mean that other people are actually like, you know, also downloading these things right now? Possible. Cool. Okay, so we have our URLs. Uh, let's open one of those, see what we have. Right. So it's, it's a bunch of probabilities over Bolzano. Okay. And which okay. class is it again? That's urban, right? Is that continuous, dense urban? Continuous urban, yeah. Continuous urban, okay. Yeah. So not a lot of it, apparently. Okay, so we can also use the entire time series and do some computation because that's the purpose. Of, of its existence, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can pretend that uh, this is a binary classification. I said the classification threshold to to open five, which is obviously wrong because it's a very very, very multi-class uh, classification. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just let's just do that and uh, read each of the each of the rasters and return a uh, binary classification. And then after that, uh, just add those to get a cumulative count of how long an area has been continuous urban. Okay. Okay, so that's pretty anonymous, right? Yeah, but you can see that, you know, um, the, I guess that's the historical center. Does yes. anyone know Bolzano well enough to verify this? Let's move on. Okay. 
Okay, so let's let's do something else. So we have remotely sensed um, a mineral extraction area in Germany. We'll be using the bounds of that to look at another land cover class. Also, something that is slightly more dynam dynamic than uh, you know dense urban buildings yeah, in a historical exactly. city. Exactly. So the, this this commented line of code is cheating here. We'll be doing that. Um, yeah, we, we will search again in the collections uh, in a title for mineral extra extraction and yeah, lowercase the title is just in case and then get all of the items from that particular co collection. So, some more waiting. Okay, maybe we, uh, oh, this is actually much faster now. Okay. Okay, so we get the asset URLs the same as before. Um, we we open all of these all of these files and then stack them in a in a three D NumPy array. So, like the purpose of this is basically we wanted to show that you can really easily with that very little code and very little frameworks or opinionated uh, things still access these things quite easily. Uh, of course, like most uh, packages also have functionality for this, but sometimes it's go to back to the basics. Even if you have to wait for like, uh, you know, 23, 24, 25 seconds, like, you know. I don't think psychic map would help with that. Don't say that. No, but actually, because the reads are parallel, and this is this is not. There you go. Fair Just for the record, we might be slightly biased for Scikit Map because we also both, you know, contribute to it, as opposed to other uh, packages. But we will we promise to not, you know, overhype it too much. We'll just use a little visualization at the end, uh, made by someone who's sitting on the front row. Don't spoil it. I think it's done. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so let's plot it first. Okay, so. So what are we looking at? Mineral extraction site over time. The, the, the class probability of it being a mineral extraction site. It seems to be moving. Yeah, it does. Can we uh, maybe also like visualize this movement somehow? Yes. Yeah. Hi, right, that's cool. Okay, so we'll we'll be using Scikit Map for that, even though we said we wouldn't. Sorry about that. Oh, it's already done. Yeah, fine. All right. Yeah, so we have to make the, the raster data object and just call the animate method method. So just two lines of code? Three if you include the import. Mm. Yeah, but now it has to read it again. Okay, but so basically we just feed it a bunch of URLs and then it will make a moving picture for us? Kind of like that, yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Wait, I'll maybe I'll zoom out a little bit. Uh, oh. Maybe not that much. All right, so we have here like an interactive uh, widget in the Jupyter environment, and we can just press play, and then you see this mine, this open air mine in Germany, just growing and uh, moving. And uh, I thought this was a really cool special case to, you know, visualize like in a couple of lines of code, how you can actually analyze uh, these kinds of drastic land use changes. And again, like, you know, maybe the specific probability levels are not always reliable because it's very hard to calibrate a mo model properly, but it's pretty clear on a large scale. Okay, I think that concludes the live demo. Yes.
All right, so um, I hope that there was, you know, the wait was worth it. But um, we also learned something during the project that this was basically uh, a result of. Uh, especially both working in small organizations that, you know, uh, not bite off more than they can chew, but chew off more than they can bite and kind of like grow as you go along. And uh, also like a personal experience for me from being a PhD uh, candidate in such an environment, where, which, you know, uh, you are uh, confronted often with the limits that project uh, requirements impose upon you while still needing to write like a good scientific paper about it. So I want to, you know, give some examples of that. Um, I mentioned reviewer number two before, and this is about the land cover maps. And um, this is a scientific review. And they basically uh, said that uh, the results were bad and that we therefore should not publish them. But it's about the method, and the method was sound. He did not say anything about that, at least in this part of the review. He was like generally quite strict, or you know, they. Um, however, uh, despite it seeming chaotic, it was actually quite successful. Uh, both organizations doubled in size and uh, led to uh, much bigger projects like Open Earth Monitor that um, continue to use our work. And also, EcoDataCube was actually also a part of that. So, to go a little bit deeper into this uh, project requirements versus scientific rigor, uh, as I said, we wanted to reproduce the Korean classes. And Korean contains some gems like, uh, and I see someone nodding in the back there, uh, land principally occupied by agriculture with significant areas of natural veg vegetation. And what is significant? And uh, transitional woodland shrub. What does that mean? Is that like a time series classified as a, you know, at a, at a single moment? And then we also have complex cultivation patterns, which is basically Korean language for we don't really know, but it's plants. Um, and so originally in the project, people found these classes quite scary to classify and you know, chose to leave them out, which is sensible if you just want to go for high accuracy. Um, so we, we tried to map like a, a limited selection of these classes and look, Korean is a hierarchical legend. And at the top, at like the five levels, it was actually quite accurate. It doesn't really, it wasn't worse than any other map, you know, of Europe that has a, like a handful of classes. But of course, you know, the reviewers didn't really focus on that part, even though we tried to emphasize, look, you can't really map complex cultivation patterns and also have accuracy at like a 30 meter resolution. So um, we submitted it anyway. And just don't mind the typos. These are not my typos. These are, these are the reviewers typos. Uh, they, was, they were complaining about the accuracy, but I think this is actually something that, you know, you see a lot in publications. People just publish when they have high accuracy, but we just wanted to publish the method. And also we were bound to the Korean legend because that was the project that we were funded for. So do you want to make a good, like, good science or do you want to make a good map or do you want to be a good project partner? You know, like you have to balance these things. And I, th I thought that was quite interesting coming from the commercial sector um, where in my personal experience, I used to map uh, oil palm plantations and then there's no validation, just the customer looks at it and he's like, oh yeah, that looks about right, cool, and then they're happy, which was also a surprise to me back then. But anyway, so this reviewer really was super unhappy uh, with the accuracy metrics, but we just wanted to like do proper reporting and we promised to reproduce Korean. So we recomputed everything and this time actually we did just with all the classes. So. Reviewer number two also had something to say about that. Quite strange that after receiving relatively low accuracy when mapping 33 classes, as described in the first version of the manuscript, and after my comment on the weak performance of this approach, the authors decided to even extend the legend of their map to 44 classes. And the editor was okay with that. So apparently, you know, I was happy that the editor actually, you know, figured out like, okay, you know, accuracy is less important than having a proper method. Uh, so we didn't adjust the number of classes like the reviewer suggested but not to improve the accuracy. So, um, you know, these are like some, some small personal experiences, but of course this presentation is actually about the AcroData Cube, and uh, it does have a role with an open earth monitor. Um, that's something that we still need to discuss, and also that we're gonna update these land cover maps, also taking into account the various uh, feedback that we've received, and just, you know, the lessons that we learned about it. So the role of Data Cube and Open Earth Monitor is that it 
was originally funded with this GeoHarmonizer project, but actually it's also being funded by Open Earth Monitor now. And it will be used to visualize and serve, uh, you know, European covering, Europe covering data sets, such as, uh, you know, a lot of things from uh, Work Package 5, which is European data. Uh, also, um, we will host dynamic soil predictions based on Sentinel and Landsat to support the EU soil observatory. But we will actually also be using it to host open data from other projects that we participate in. For instance, the AI for Soil Health project. Don't mind the for as, you know, the, you know, the word for. I'm uh, not sure how I feel about that, but, you know, it's a good project. And we will be hosting an entire soil health data cube there on like multi, multiple levels, you know, uh, soil organic carbon. Uh, and uh, we will keep supporting and expanding this platform, keeping it easy to reach for free, fast, well, you know, maybe like 42 seconds sometimes, uh, with new and uh, better data. Uh, for instance, these land cover maps, and that's also something that is actually the last part. So, if you work with, you know, external funding, the European Union wants a good land cover map. So it has to be accurate, but it also has to, if you want to also write publications about it, the science also has to be good. And there's, there's a trade-off here, but, you know, ideally you want to have a good, you, have, you want to have good science and also a good map. So how do you do that? Um, well, one thing we want to improve is to give this new version uh, more classes and also more sensible ones. So not like these, you know, weird land use, land cover mix classes, such as, uh, you know, uh, transitional woodland shrub or complex cultivation patterns or the other long one, which I forget. Uh, so we're going to actually use Lucas land cover, which has more classes, in it, but it's also hierarchical. For instance, if you look at uh, uh, wheat and uh, potatoes are both crops, but they are not both serials. And so there must be some way, if you have a hierarchical legend, to get an accurate map with as much detail as possible. And, you know, more classes is less accuracy? Well, not necessarily. I think that it's possible to have more classes without sacrificing accuracy if you have a good way of getting pixel-based uncertainty and hierarchical legends. There is something called selective classification, where basically you only make classifications when the model is confident enough. You leave the map open where uh, the model has uh, like not insufficient confidence. Uh, for instance, only the parts where we're really sure that it's maze, there we'll, we will say, okay, it's maze, but then there's empty pixels around, and I don't think people like empty pixels on a map. So what if you could say, we uh, will only say it's maze if we are really certain, and if we're not certain, can we improve the certainty somehow by making it serials instead? Or maybe even like if we're really uncertain that it's serials or root crops, at least it's probably cropland. And then um, there are techniques, for instance, conformal prediction, which I'm not going to go into right now, but I've been uh, uh, looking into it, where you can actually get pixel-based uncertainty estimates that have a statistical guarantee at least if you properly cover the feature space with the machine learning technique that you employ. So um, that is one thing. And then there's also another thing that I just submitted a paper on. Uh, it's a post-processing technique that uh, we call iterative mapping of probabilities or IMP. And um, basically this takes as input predicted probabilities by any kind of machine learning model for uh, you know whatever kind of classification task you have. I mean, in, in my case, it's uh, land use, uh, land cover. And also a class area estimate, for instance, one from uh, Eurostat that says, well, uh, the Netherlands is supposed to have 52% cropland and 22% uh, forest. It's probably less because, you know, the Netherlands is not very forested. And then as output, it makes a hard class map whose distributions exactly match this uh, uh, independent area estimate. So instead of trying to make a map and, you know, balancing the model right and balancing the training data right, you just like make an imbalanced prediction and then you force it to become balanced with an external area estimate. And it turned out in this paper that is, you know, not even in review yet, I mean, it's just been submitted, uh, that these maps can be more accurate than uh, if you just use highest likelihood classification. And this, of course, this, this difference in accuracy is greater when you use a more imbalanced model, but then you can actually just combine different training data sets which is also what we're going to do in the new maps. We're going to combine Eurocrops, which is also mentioned, 
and uh, extract training data from Corrine, which we also extensively filter, to make a giant imbalanced training data set and then adjust for uh, the, the, the biases in these models for every NUTS2 region, probably, in, the, in Europe, to make sure that every NUTS2 region has an accurate map that also matches the area estimates that you know, uh, official statistical services uh, generate. So we are currently working on combining these two techniques, basically, to make new maps of Europe with more classes. And you know, I'm pretty enthusiastic about the, these things, uh, but I think there's like a room filled with people here that know a lot about land cover and care a lot about land cover. And I'm, I'm thinking, like, what is more important? Like, where, do, where, where should you put this trade-off? Like, is it more important to have like an overall more accurate map? Is it really important to have pixel-wise uncertainty? Is it important to have, uh, you know, that the map has the correct proportions as uh, dictated by uh, you know, people that actually go into the field and measure it. How important is it to have complete thematic detail? Is it better to have an inaccurate map that has all the corn predictions, or is it better to have a map that says, well, this is corn, we know that for sure, and this might be corn, but at least it's cropland. Or is it actually better to just leave those uh, more abstract predictions just open? And uh, that's actually what I want to ask you. So, questions? Uh, yeah, I think that's a very important uh, topic because, um, so basically you are describing the difference in produce a product or a, not a product, but a map or a deliverable for a project, like in the sake of research and you have a paper and that's fine. And, and the other, it's how you can really produce like an official map that will support the policy makers and like and they can use that to make some claims, right? Yeah. So, and, and I think it's, it's important to, to think about it and, and define like how we can tackle it. I, I'm not European, so I don't have experience here. But in Brazil, for example, there is a clear difference. So what Gilberto was saying today, that the forestation data that Prodis is producing for decades, that's the number that Brazil will take to the climate uh, conference. And, and like that's the official number that the, the Brazil can use and, and really put in the table. And we also have like uh, support, like other official organizations delivering land cover maps. Uh, but on the other hand, we have, for example, initiatives as map biomes that are doing like land cover map, annual base. They change the, the methodology, not the methodology, but they reproduce uh, like the whole map and they generate new collections every year. Uh, but this is a kind of third sector initiative. So in this way, they started like moving fast, but uh, it's a bit difficult for, for example, for Brazil, just take these maps and really start making some official numbers. So. And considering the context of the project, I think we should discuss that. So how we can, uh, as project, as Open Earth Model, how we can support that in a, in a, in a way, if that's actually our role, I don't know. So, and, and so how these things will work. And, and so otherwise we can just like publish a paper and okay, that's fine. But I, I don't know if the commission is expecting only that. I don't have an answer. I'm just putting my part. <laughs> well, thank you for your input. Those are valid points. There's no direct expectations that we have to provide official data for statistics or something. So just to make it very clear, the uh, things we do in Open Earth Monitor is experimental. So it's uh, primarily for the purpose of testing and uh, research and innovation. Uh, so I would my answer to your question will be very simple. Uh, try to do with a super detailed agent and see uh, how does it compares to the you know, ignoring that, for example, crop types, you see how does, what is the performance? So already if you have a better accuracy for me, that's a reason enough to use that method. That's the, that's really the key. Accuracy is the, for us I mean, at the moment, most, most interesting to see whether there's some improvements. And I agree with you, this discussion with review was maybe, um, maybe not needed. Uh, and there was a, uh, this um, impact of scale, you know, and, uh, 
the thematic scale in this case. You mm -hmm. know, it was kind thematic of, resolution, you mean, like how deep yeah, into the legend yeah, you go? Yeah, that was a bit yeah. confusing, and so that was a, a bit uh, uh, maybe not so uh, productive, but uh, still reviewers, of course, they have a right to ask anything. Um, and uh, yes, there are many products now, global products, you know, they there's this trade-off, you know, they go for high resolution, 10 meter, but then they do like 11 classes. And, yeah. uh, so, so there is always it depends on the context, right? I mean, if yeah, but I think that's a shame. Like, uh, it, if you look at other fields of machine learning, for instance, like uh, computer vision, you have models that can classify thousands of different classes. Like, we're just like classifying what, like thirty? Like, we should, you know, yes, yes, see no. if we can do better. No, and so we let's blow it up. Let's do more classes mm -hmm. because I, I mentioned accuracy. That's the one thing that. Is important, right? If you can see, look, if you use this method, that method, we have a bit increase in accuracy. Then the other thing is the usability. Uh, usability also has accuracy as a component, but usability is uh, really something that you you think uh, so in multiple contexts, uh, multiple applications. You know what works better for people. What what and for sure there, I can tell you, you have more classes, you will have more usability. It's because you can answer more. You can answer more. Yeah, if you balance the trade off, right? Yes. Uh, I also saw a question in the back, I think. Yeah, you. Not so much a question because you were asking the questions. So rather, rather uh, towards towards answers. So first of all, congratulations. I think you are on a on a very good track. Don't, don't get uh, uh, shied away by some reviewers uh, very I mean th the correct answer to that review that you were showing I don't know what else he was putting there but if that was his main comment then I would have replied you just waited wasted your time on a review which is completely useless <laughs> well and, I mean the review was actually quite longer okay it's, good. It's actually, okay, maybe there was something here, useful in it and it's thing. fine but 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 I such a statement is just not worth the the, 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 the time to write it anyhow um, to, to your questions here I, I think it's it's in a way, uh, I would not say any of this is, is more important than anything else. I would see it as a, as a kind of a, a process in working from, from through the value chain, something I talked about yesterday, where at a certain point, and something we heard this morning, by the way, that was this truth problem in, in, in data, which is, of course, a discussion which is, to my opinion, pretty void because we, we shouldn't search for anything like that. But in essence, what we need is tools that get from the data to the information. And we have to accept that at a certain point, information, for me, the difference between data and information is that information is something that is targeted. There is a question behind. Data is just facts. It's just something you, you distill and you do without having any purpose in mind. You just collect information, you, you just collect status quo facts. If you have information, if you have questions about uncertainties, about class proportions, if we talk land cover, that's usually uh, uh, directed at someone who has a certain idea of, of the outcome. He wants to use that for something specific, and we need uh, 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 processes that, that are able to basically get us to information without all the time going back to the raw data. In the future, this will break the, the paradigm because the, the, the raw data are getting too big. And, and these proportions or whatever you, you have in between are, I think, perfectly the perfect idea to, to, to establish an, an, a layer in between, something that is not the raw data but is not yet the information. And then you, you, you have to establish tools that basically make it possible to interpret these data to get answers to yeah, in, based in on your use case. So yeah. I, I would I would say yes. Go uh, develop that first. I think that's a very good a very good uh, uh, way in which we can address the, the problem overall. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Is there anyone else who has a question or a remark? Oh, yeah. With, with tuning to statistics is not new. I remember we had uh, forest maps in the late 90s early 2000s built on i don't even remember what sensor that was my paper cites those <laughs> my paper cites those okay yeah. and, and they were basically doing the same they were tuning the statistics uh, they were tuning the, the 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 classification so that it fit the statistics somehow looked really strange but uh, well that's one way to 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 work with it of course you have to make sure then at which point you you basically 
uh, uh, feed into your into your processing chain data that is no longer observation based but that comes from any other source because at that point you kind of uh, uh, leave the the pure observational track you you put in you put something in which is coming from 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 the outside and that's very important to, to track mm -hmm. otherwise no one can understand the result okay how much time do we have left yeah that but that's also why we're working on it right no no the question is not whether we will do it it's how right that's that's what this uh, this slide is really about uh, but I totally agree I mean we're already working on it I mean now it's more like of course we need good training data we need uh, good you know uh, processing we need good compute but we have those things the question now is like how do you use these things to make the most useful map like a map that actually people will be happy with and that they can actually use for something either be it like research or policy or whatever that's the, the more important question I think that's a good point Okay, well, um, thank you for the discussion and the input. And I think uh, it's one o'clock now and lunch is being served. So how about we get something to eat? <laughs>